It's a pleasure and privilege to introduce Rudolphs. Rudolphs, that is Susan H. Rudolph and Lloyd I. Rudolph. The name is so familiar to students of South Asian studies that it takes some time. At least it took me some time when I was a student to realize that it stood for two different individuals. <laughs> I used to believe there's one person called Rudolphs. <laughs> They studied together at Harvard. They taught together at Chicago, which is where they are emeritus professor now. They wrote together on South Asia, and they have lived together in US and in India. For more than five decades, their work as scholar and as teacher has left a deep influence on the field of South Asian studies. I'm very happy to see some of their students, some of their colleagues, and some of the former friends. I just realized T.N. Chaturvedi came specially, and he said this was his very first visit to CSDS, though he's known Kothari since 1962, <laughs> uh, for this lecture. So delightful uh, uh, this occasion becomes, therefore. Their work spans across different subdisciplinary and disciplinary boundaries, across methodological boundaries, across the discipline. They have worked on political economy, the famous book called In Pursuit of Lakshmi, The Political Economy of the Indian State, which came out in the mid-80s, 1987. They have worked on political theory, the work on Gandhi, the traditional roots of uh, Karishma, uh, and later on the work on the postmodern Gandhi uh, is where they related to this aspect. They have worked on political sociology, uh, their early work redefined our understanding of caste and how it relates to politics. They worked on public policy, this book on cultural policy in India, and the work on making sense of Indian state, which comes together in a series of essays that they worked together over the years, which has come out recently called Explaining Indian Democracy, a 50-year perspective. And indeed, on foreign policy, a book on making US foreign policy towards South Asia, regional imperatives and the imperial presidency. In methodological terms, they have deployed various tools within the discipline of political science, which includes survey research, something we forget. Actually, in the late 1950s, they carried out one of the first public opinion sample-based surveys in India, they were very, very kind to deposit the archive of that survey with Lokniti CSDS and its data ar archive currently. It's one of the first surveys of po political public opinion in India. They have thoroughly used archival history, uh, the study of Diary of Amar Singh uh, being one of the prime examples of that. They have done field-based ethnographic research, especially in their study of caste. As I mentioned, they have studied on public policy and on conceptual analysis. In geographical terms, they have worked from local to the national. They've worked on Tamil Nadu, and of course, they've very extensively worked on Rajasthan. This kind of work in the older days could easily be boxed under the heading of area studies. But their argument has always challenged the definition and epistemic positioning of area studies. This point needs to be remembered and registered. While working in and with the discipline of political science in the US, their work has always been somewhat uneasy with the dominant ways of American science of politics. As they shared recently, they said, quote, we imagined we were plumbing the true underpinnings of the recently launched Indian experiment in democracy. What we hadn't counted on, and what we gradually came to realize, was that American ideology, particularly the universalism and individualism of American hegemonic Lockean liberalism, had shaped the concepts and methods, not only of survey research, but also of the then prevailing Parsonian structure functionalism of modernization theory. Unquote. As you look at their work, actually even at the time when they mention we hadn't realized, but actually if you look at the work of the early 60s, that realization seeps through that work uh, in quite clear ways. 
The very first book, Modernity of Tradition, questioned the dominant flat-footed and teleological assumptions of the then dominant models of modernization. They carried this unease throughout their professional and intellectual career. This came to the center stage when they, in particular Suzanne Rudolph, became the leading voice of perestroika movement. I don't know how many political science students here would remember. In the in year 2002, 2003, this is not the perestroika of the ex-USSR. This is the perestroika in the discipline of political science in America. In 2002, 2003, there is this rebellion against rational choice, quantitatively determined mo mechanical models of understanding politics. And as a result of that, this movement, uh, at the end of this movement, uh, Susan Rudolph, at the, at the peak of this movement, Susan Rudolph was elected the president of American Political Science Association. And this change led to some long-lasting reforms in the discipline. In that sense, this perestroika was perhaps more effective than the other better known perestroika. Uh, intellectual premises of this challenge were articulated by Susan Rudolph in a presidential address to the APSA, American Political Science Association, entitled The Imperialism of Categories. That address explored how Western, particularly Western ideology, contributed to an ideological hegemony in Western social science research. Today's lecture draws upon that formulation. May I therefore invite the Rudolphs to deliver the lecture. Thank you.